My name's Professor Richard Harvey. I'm an ENT surgeon by training, but I really practice solely in the nose and sinus, which makes me a rhinologist. I work here in Sydney, based at St. Vincent's Hospital, University of Macquarie and University of New South Wales. What indications suggest that rhinitis is not simple? So I think there's three or four things that we can choose to decide that then rhinitis is not a simple rhinitis. The first one is looking at current guidelines. If you really haven't had a response to intranasal corticosteroid, then it's the highly chance that you don't have simple allergic rhinitis. I think other things that are hallmarks that your rhinitis is not simple is where you the nose responds to other things other than simple allergy. So this is a patient who complains a reactive nose to perfume, cigarette smoke, other noxious things in our environment rather than classic allergens. Um, I think patients who present with a disproportionate sense of mucus at the back of their throat, what we call a post-nasal drip, where they really don't have many other anterior or other nasal symptoms, or they, it's incredibly disproportionate. They're bothered more by the sense of their mucus in their throat. This is probably not a rhinitis. This is more likely to be a condition such as reflux, what we refer to as extraesophageal or laryngopharyngeal reflux. Um, some traditional things I think are important are uh, the concept that if you've lost your smell is a sign that it's probably not a simple rhinitis. I think if you have a bad smell in your nose, this is a sign it's not a simple rhinitis. And if it's very asymmetric, so if it seems like one side is affected more than the other, then this is probably a sign that it's not a simple rhinitis as well. What treatment options work for allergic rhinitis versus sinusitis? So if someone ha truly has an allergic rhinitis, they'll almost always say that their condition has been with them most of their life. So there's an association with a childhood reactive nose, some childhood asthma. Now, this childhood rhinitis and asthma has its origins in allergy, and these patients do well if introduced to immunotherapy or disease-modulating agents early in the piece. Now, to make that happen, it's really one has to be sure of what their immune system is reacting to. So this is where a skin test becomes important. It, it identifies a protein that then is available to target. Now we usually use that protein really as a protein to help stimulate the immune system to shift itself from being atopic or overly reactive to being an immune system that's tolerant. Now this is done in modern day immunotherapy with oral agents. So there, about 10 or 15 years ago, there was a shift away from subcutaneous immunotherapy to oral agents. Now these were initially done as sublingual drops. The problems with sublingual immunotherapy is it often lacked precision and there wasn't good standardization of concentration of the protein. This has changed in the last five or 10 years. Um, there's better production of oral agents and in recent years, there's been the development of tablets which really provide a great standardization of what allergen protein is being exposed to the patient. Now, in immunotherapy, if you've picked the right protein, most patients will complain of a subtle degree of oral symptoms. They'll get a bit of itch, sometimes some swelling under their tongue or their lip when they first start the treatment. Escalation, we call it, is when patients initially start, they get some local symptoms, and often their allergy seems to get worse for four to six weeks. This is a normal response on people going on to immunotherapy. Now, the response from immunotherapy should be actually be very quick. You should see in the first six months that someone notice a clinical benefit from being on immunotherapy. And if they do, it's usually very easy to convince them to remain on it. And a standard course is about 36 months. It's, there are studies to show that if you have at least 36 months of immunotherapy, you're able to lock in a permanent shift in someone's immune response to that protein. Now, although many patients may be polysensitized, there is a movement to really taking only one protein and using it to trigger this immune response. And when you do it for one, so say someone is co-sensitized with other things but also has dust mite, if you just use the dust mite protein, you can induce a response in someone's immune system that shifts their entire immune response towards being non-atopic. So that's probably some of the changes that have really occurred in immunotherapy that I think are important. Now. When it comes then to the role of immunotherapy in sinus disease, 
This is, uh, we rarely use immunotherapy to treat severe inflammatory sinus disease because this sinus disease, like adult onset asthma, usually doesn't occur in childhood. It comes on as an adult. Its origins are not an IgE-mediated allergy condition. Uh, it doesn't respond to immunotherapy because its origins are not part of the atopic problem. Uh, it's still an eosinophilic condition, though, and does do well from corticosteroids. And so rather than going down the path of immunotherapy for patients with adult-onset asthma and sinus disease, we really push the delivery of corticosteroids, making sure that those corticosteroids get effectively into the lungs and they get effectively into the sinuses. And then there are newer agents on the market, such as mepoluzumab, which is an antibody against IL-5, which is part of the eosinophilic response for adult asthma and polyposis. And, and this is what I consider immunotherapy for sinusitis and polyposis and adult asthma, these newer antibody treatments. So Montelukas and other leukotriene inhibitors do have a role in, in helping to block some of the allergic cascade. So in childhood asthma and childhood rhinitis that's not well controlled, um, leukotriene inhibitors have been shown to improve the control of those children. Um, I think they have a role there. Their leukotrienes are part of the allergic phenomenon. Um, and they, apart from corticosteroids, some of the treatments such as antihistamines really have uh, a very limited ability to block some of the allergic cascade that occurs. And so in, in children in particular and adolescents who appear to have poorly controlled allergic rhinitis and asthma, I think there's a, definitely a role for leukotriene inhibitors. Um, when it comes to adult onset asthma, it's very hit and miss. Uh, there's very little evidence to show a consistent or robust approach. Uh, they have been tried um, to help patients who have uh, adult asthma and polyposis, but there's very little evidence that there's a consistent response. So in my mind, leukotriene inhibitors such as Montelukas are really reserved for children who have classic inhalant allergy that's not well controlled.